what a wonderful weekend it's been. What a great conference so far. Um, brilliant day yesterday. Very inspiring talks. And um, one thing before I uh, start my talk, which I think will become quite relevant as, as I uh, carry on over the next 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I thought Steve Bennett, you know, his, uh, speech yesterday at the dinner was very heartfelt. And there was something quite interesting that he brought up, which was the fact that, um, you know, in India, these people who were in the slums, that they, they were having hope after he helped to contribute to their education, to empower them actually with, uh, with jobs. And I think that's a really important concept for us to start to understand a bit better, is that if people don't feel in control of their lives, if they're not educated, if they have low self-esteem, it is very, very damaging to mental health and to physical health. So people are suffering. Our healthcare system is in a real crisis, more than ever. My dad said that unless we, and this is before he passed away, unless we do something, the NHS, um, you know, he actually said it's already broken. It is all already broken. I think we can't talk about it on the breaking point anymore. It's broken. So we need, to, we need to think about how do we fix this problem of the NHS. And also, most importantly for us here, is to improve population health. That's one of the prime objectives of the public health collaboration. So let's just start and remind ourselves what the actual, I think this is the best definition of health I, I found and from the WHO. So it's a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And a couple of, I think, really good definitions of public health, because again, it's about our identity as public health collaboration. I think we need to acknowledge this. So the science and art of promoting health, preventing disease and prolonging life through organized efforts of society. And also public health is a science and art of organized societal efforts to ensure and create the conditions for the highest possible level of health and well-being of of the populations consistent with the values of social justice and human rights. But where are we in public health? It's unfortunately a very um, dire situation. So we know that life expectancy in the UK certainly has stalled since 2010. And the um, burden of chronic disease as in healthy life expectancy is not improving. In fact, in many parts of the country, this is quite recent in the BMJ, a new story, in many parts of the country it's getting worse. Um, so we, we're not making any significant inroads, certainly in the last decade. And we all know that because either, either as members of the public, as patients, as doctors, we see the suffering around us and we know that there are worsening issues around mental health and physical health. So how can we explain this? And this is what I'm going to get into over the, in my talk is, first of all, let's understand the problem. Let's understand where it's coming from. And then let's try and think about what are the solutions to overcome this crisis that we're in. And of course, you know, this talk isn't going to be a diet talk. I think there were some excellent uh, talks yesterday already from Nina, from David, from Zoe, to explain the issues around the problems of dietary guidelines and the food environment, et cetera. Um, but, you know, this problem of uh, the overfat uh, epidemic, if you like, you know, we talk about obesity affecting 60% of, well, being overweight or obese affects 60% of adult UK population, one in three children by the time they leave primary school in the same category. But actually probably worse than that is the fact that excess body fat, which affects many people who have a so-called normal body mass index, actually results in about 80% probably of the adult UK population having uh, excess body fat that's going to pose a risk to their health. And of course, that drives many of these conditions. We know about type 2 diabetes, we know about heart disease, but likely also many other chronic conditions, including uh, Alzheimer's disease and certainly even cancer. I mean, it's estimated that obesity alone is probably responsible for about 40% of cancers as well. So tackling this of, of ab is absolutely paramount to solving this healthcare crisis. It's definitely one of the most important issues, but not the only one. So I, I, I always put this slide up and I'm gonna go a little bit further so to avoid a bit of repetition for many of you here, but I, I think this um, analytical framework for teaching and practicing medicine helps us understand the problems that we're in, the issue that we're in. So as doctors, as healthcare practitioners, our role is to improve patient outcomes. What does that mean? It means reduce suffering, 
The ultimate purpose of knowledge, certainly for doctors, is to reduce human suffering, manage risks, and treat illness. And there are three components to that that are crucial. Our individual clinical expertise, our clinical knowledge, our experience, best available, available evidence, and last but not least, patients' values and expectations. We call that shared decision-making. Um, Steve yesterday talks about the fact that health coaches are different from doctors in some ways because doctors ask patients uh, what's the matter, whereas health coaches will focus on what matters to you. We need more doctors to be actually focusing on what matters to you. And there's evidence, very good evidence, why that, how that will improve patient outcomes, which I'll come on to. So again, I just want to mention this briefly because this also links into the the commercial wider determinants of health, which I will elaborate on, is um, the two most important aspects for a doctor. If I'm teaching medical students, I tell them clinical history taking and empathy. So history taking is actually the most important thing to get the factor, to get the diagnosis. It's, uh, there's very good uh, research on this. In fact, the Nobel Prize winning uh, laureate Bernard Lown, cardiologist actually, did an analysis of this many years ago and calculated about 80% of your diagnosis comes purely from the history, from the conversation. About 5% from the examination, 5% from simple tests, 5% from uh, more sort of elaborate tests, and 5% you don't ever get a diagnosis, but the patient gets better. So the reason that's important is I've increasingly seen and I get referrals from doctors in the US, very, you know, eminent doctors, patients coming to me certainly in, in my private clinic with just test results and want me to interpret test results. And I'm saying, hold on a minute, I don't treat test results. I treat the patient. What is the history? Because actually a lot of this over investigation, looking at just results, um, is actually not very healthy. It Increase, increases health anxiety, you don't get to the diagnosis, you can go down the wrong track. So let's just, you know, I just want to remind people here that the history is the most important thing. And of course, it doesn't cost anything. It's about your clinical knowledge. And of course, empathy is really important for patient satisfaction. If you're not an empathetic doctor, you are going to uh, certainly fall short of improving your patient outcomes and making your patients feel happier, giving them hope, giving them empowerment. Okay, so what's wrong with the best available evidence, the second component. Well, as we all know, as many of you know, that that evidence has been corrupted by commercial interests. And if you're using evidence that's biased and corrupted and incomplete, you are gonna get suboptimal outcomes or even cause harm to your patient. So what are the factors behind that? Just to, just to uh, remind everybody, so you've got the biased funding of research, research that's funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients. Bias reporting in medical journals, bias patient pamphlets, bias reporting in the media, big, big problem, really big problem, especially now. Commercial conflicts of interest, of course, defensive medicine, and last but not least, the inability, uh, well, medical curricula that fails to teach doctors how to comprehend and then effectively communicate health statistics in a way that patients can understand them and is more honest. And of course, the issue around that is about relative risks and absolute risks. And I'm not going to do, give you a lecture on that today. Um, but actually, we should be always communicating with patients when it comes to a drug prescription in absolute risk terms, because that's more honest. So, for example, if you're low risk of heart disease, as I tell my patients, if you're low risk of heart disease, taking a statin every day for five years religiously, according to industry sponsored data, which again is likely exaggerated and excludes patients with side effects, will give you a 1% chance of preventing a non-fatal heart attack but it will not prolong your life. That's different for people with heart disease. Um, uh, but again, this, this is the way we should be communicating with patients and it is not widespread. I suspect a very, very, very small minority of doctors in the country are doing this. And that part of that is lack of knowledge. Part of it is it's not ingrained in training and these things do take time, but that is crucial to inform consent and share decision-making. So what else is, well, so what, what is the overall picture of the best available data um, in terms of the evidence and what's the impact on the population? So John Ioannidis, who's the most cited medical si uh, researcher in the world, you know, I would call it, I always refer to him as the Stephen Hawking-like figure of medicine, very, very smart guy. He published this paper many years ago and things haven't changed very much. Why he says most published research findings are false and actually one of the factors he puts behind that and think about this with, and, you know, I think people will get what I'm talking about, but just think about this very carefully, certainly with what's happening now and how this might feed into the current narrative on certain medications being prescribed or used widely. The greater the financial and the other prejudice, interests and prejudices in the scientific field, the less likely 
the research findings are to be true. Okay, so how do we get through this medical misinformation mess? How do we survive it? How do we combat it? Um, because I think most doctors are unaware, certainly, that of the poor quality research that contributes to overuse, underuse of effective treatments or safer, simpler, uh, cheaper treatments, even underuse of lifestyle, avoidable adverse events, missed opportunities for right care, treating the right patient with the right drug at the right time through informed consent, and of course, huge amounts of waste. In fact, the wastefulness um, has been estimated in the US. I mean, 20 to 50% of healthcare activity either harms patients, is wasteful, or is inappropriate. I mean, that's a huge amount, up to 50% of all healthcare. And that's, and that's rooted in a very commercialized system of healthcare. So what are the key points? Much published research is not reliable, offers no, no benefit to patients, or is not useful to decision makers. Most healthcare professionals are not aware of this problem. So that's another issue. There's a, a great quote from Noam Chomsky, um, the uh, American economist, who says, the general population doesn't know what is happening, and they don't even know that they don't know. Apply that to doctors as well. They also lack the necessary skills to evaluate the reliability and usefulness of medical science. And then patients and families then lack the relevant accurate medical evidence and skill guidance at the time of medical decision making. And I can tell you even, for, and this is quoted from John Ioannidis' paper, ignorance of this problem is even at the highest levels of academic and clinical leadership is profound. Now, I've had my own experience in my own journey over the last 10 years as a campaigner and activist and meeting many people and talking to them, whether it's talking to uh, the Secretary State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, about sugar, whether it's talking to healthcare leaders, whether it's NHS England, whether it's the BMA, whether it's the medical royal colleges, and I've had the privilege and honor to speak, to sit amongst some of those royal college presidents and have a, a dialogue with them, but also at the same time realizing these people that over the years as a junior doctor I thought were all knowledgeable and knew everything were actually um, you know, very, un to put it politely, very unaware of these issues around evidence, whether it's about sugar or whether it's about statins or cholesterol. So don't presume because they are eminent that they understand the evidence. This is, you know, we are here for evidence-based medicine, not eminence-based medicine. Unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the healthcare problems are being driven by eminence-based medicine. So what can we talk, how do we get to the roots of this a bit further? So. Obviously, a lot of the best available evidence when it comes to treatments is driven by uh, industry spot, drug industry sponsored um, uh, clinical trials. But what's the problem? Well, we have to start by acknowledging this very clear, simple fact. Pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies have a legal obligation as businesses to make a profit and declare a shareholder dividend by selling their product. They are not required to give you the best treatment. You can also apply this to the information when it comes to food industry and the marketing of, of products, you know, low fat, high sugar, all that kind of stuff. Marketing is healthy. In fact, it's actually, if someone wants to do a study, I'm sure they will find that most of the products that are marketed, that need to be marketed as healthy, are probably going to have the opposite effect on your health. So I always tell my patients, if it's marketed as healthy, don't eat it. <laughs> but the real scandal is this. The regulators fail to prevent misconduct by industry and that doctors, institutions and journals that have a responsibility to patients and scientific integrity collude, collude with industry for financial gain. And this is a huge problem. I mean, this is probably just a tip of the iceberg. Between 2009 and 2014, most of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies were found guilty for fraud, which basically included illegal marketing of drugs, uh, hiding data on harms, um, you know, misrepresentation of research results. Yet, no executive in those companies lost their job, nobody got demoted, nobody got fired, and there was clear evidence in all of these cases that they knew that the drugs that were, they were promoting, that they were um, influencing the regulator to get approved was gonna harm people, and they withheld that information deliberately. And this is likely just the tip of the iceberg because this is what we know about. This is what, where legally they have been found guilty. And, and actually, you know, Peter, um, Peter Gosher, co-founder of the Cochrane Collaboration, um, his, 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 uh, one of his solutions is top executives should be held personally accountable so that it would need to think about the risk of imprisonment when they consider performing or acquiescing in these crimes. 
And, you know, it sounds very um, unfortunate that I have to say this, but this is a fact. Now, in internal documents and emails, and I won't name a particular drug company, you can look it up yourself, um, have shown that even when they knew, for example, a drug was going to cause huge cardiovascular harms uh, to patients, they said, oh, it's unfortunate, but the drug will do really well. They take this as a cost of business, that people are going to be killed by the drugs that they are approving and then withholding that information about the risk. This is just a cost of business. And, and actually, the system has not improved because they still end up making more profit. So um, GSK was fined $3 billion in 2012 for the biggest, you know, that was the biggest fine uh, in the history of, uh, of, of sort of fraud, if you like, in the drug industry. And um, during the period covered by the settlement, it was, it was the same sort of problems with several drugs. They actually made $25 billion in profit. So it's still profitable. It's just a risk they take. Okay, so let's talk about the impact of, let's just say, well, some of you would say, well, hold on a minute, Asim. You know, drugs save lives and the pharmaceutical industry, all this innovation and fine, you know, there may be a little bit of this stuff going on. We accept it, but actually overall, the net effect of drugs that have been prescribed on the population has been positive. Absolutely false. So we have lots of data now. This is specific, this is a great paper, you can look it up, it's free access, open access. Institutional corruption of pharmaceuticals and the myth of safe and effective drugs. Oops, sorry, uh, I'll use a pointer. Okay, there we go. So this is data from France. And if you see here, you can basically look at all the drugs that have, over a 10 year period that have been approved. And actually what's interesting is so, um, more than half of them, 54%, had no added value. So once they were properly assessed, after they'd been approved, after they'd been used and marketed, they were shown to have no extra value over previous drugs, essentially copies of old ones. So more expensive, so again, more waste, but no previous value over other drugs. But double the amount of drugs that were produced of these, whatever, 500, uh, in, uh, no, actually, how many drugs are there? 900 and whatever drugs. More than double of the ones that were approved caused greater harm than the ones that produced added clinical benefit. So we've got more than half being essentially copies of old ones, no innovation, nothing new, nothing helpful, wasteful. And actually they produced more drugs that were harmful than actually were beneficial. So what's the conclusion from this data? It's also the same from the US. So Marcy Angel, former editor of New England Medicine, who I've spoken to a few years ago when I was writing an article for The Guardian, um, she actually did analysis herself and found that, you know, between 2000 and 2008, the overwhelming majority of 75% of drugs were copies of old ones. Only 11% were truly innovative. Part of the reason for that is that the drug industry spends about 20 times more on marketing than they do on researching new molecular entities because of the system, which again, I will go into shortly. She also said to me that the real battle in healthcare is one of truth versus money. So what do we conclude from this? Very straightforward. In the last few decades, and this sort of, this problem seems to have been exacerbated in the 80s through economic policies, which were catalyzed by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, this neoliberal economic model. So what can we say conclusively, without any doubt whatsoever? The overwhelming evidence suggests that the impact of the drug industry in the Western world, and by the way, this data from France has been replicated in Holland and Canada as well, has been a negative one. The drug industry's effect on society in the last few decades, forget about innovation for a second, the overall net effect has been negative. Marcy Angel then says it's no longer possible to trust much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authorities and medical guidelines. And she reached this conclusion reluctantly uh, after almost two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the highest impact medical journal in the world. Richard Horton, 2015, in an article he writes, so editor of The Lancet, you know, he talks about a meeting he attended, uh, which was organized by the Wellcome Trust. It was Chatham House Rules, very senior scientists who were actually able to you know, talk about the kind of things I'm talking about here, uh, said possibly half of the published literature is untrue. And he asked at the end of that editorial, he said, Who's got, science has taken a turn towards darkness. Who's going to take the first step to change the system? Nobody has so far, but I think we can. We can do this. We can change this. And then, of course, Richard uh, Smith, former editor of BMJ, also talked about the fact in British institutions there's a huge problem with research misconduct. It's, it's, it's an endemic problem, unfortunately. 
where um, you know, at least a third of people when asked said that they knew of a colleague that had fabricated data and falsified results. And these are the prestigious, some of the most prestigious institutions in the country. So I was involved, you know, I was aware of many of these issues years ago when I started my campaigning. Uh, and then I worked as a consultant clinical associate to the Medical Royal College, which was fantastic. It was a very good learning opportunity for me. I was still an SBR junior doctor then. Um, and then I encouraged, certainly, the, you know, this Too Much Medicine campaign that was started by the BMJ. I encouraged those discussions to take place amongst all the Royal College presidents. And, you know, it wasn't easy because there's lots of uh, different moving parts and there are egos and, you know, preconceived beliefs and all that kind of stuff. But after nine months, we got this published and I, uh, you know, was lucky that I got the chair of the GMC on board and the chair of the Medical Royal Colleges. Um, to launch this campaign in 2015 called Choosing Wisely. And one of the conclusions in that paper, one of the things that's important for us to remember, because we talk about waste as well. We, let's, of course, harms we want to avoid, but waste is also an issue. You know, my dad talked about the fact that NHS is under so much strain and so much pressure. A lot of that problem is because a lot of what we're doing, we're climbing up the wrong wall. We're climbing up the wrong wall. We are giving treatments and medications on very poor evidence, and it's wasteful. And, and what happens when you have waste in a, in a, in a system uh, when you've got finite resources and one doctor's waste is another patient's delay? So let's go, okay, so how well are we doing on shared decision-making, do you think? How well are we doing on, on informed consent here? Okay, let's look at the evidence. Let's look at the evidence on that. So. To actually um, engage in true shared decision-making and informed consent, um, you know, first of all, if you do that, and I'll come to the criteria in a minute, and the Cochrane Systematic Review looked at this, and this is really interesting, we talked about waste, but does informed consent, does a, a meaningful, um, transparent conversation with patients improve outcomes, and certainly does it reduce you know, overuse? And, and it does, quite significantly. Um, I think this is probably an underestimate. And by the way, you've got to remember, this is without those doctors being empowered about lifestyle as an alternative to some of the discussions, which we know is going to be so much more powerful. So we know that in, when they did a systematic review looking at shared decision-making and decision aids, patients in the experimental arms participate more actively in the decision-making process, were on average 20% more likely to make conservative choices when facing difficult decisions regarding surgical and non-surgical interventions, including drugs, even screening. And it resulted in no known adverse health outcomes, decreased satisfaction or anxiety, but patients felt they had greater knowledge gain, more confident of what mattered to them, and had more accurate expectations about risks and benefits. So again, remember, the ultimate purpose of knowledge is to reduce human suffering. Shared decision making will reduce human suffering, it will empower people. So what are the six criteria? And again, this is quite well defined. I know Campbell's going to talk a little bit more about this in his talk. Um, but actually, this is really important. And this is what I use in my framework when I see patients. I always think about, have I covered all of these six in my conversation with patients? So, description of nature of the decision. Discussion of alternatives. Of course, for me, often that's lifestyle. Discussions of risks and benefits in absolute terms. Again, think about statins, for example. Discussion of related uncertainties. So what I say to my patients, I'm very open and honest with my patients. I say, by the way, and any of, if anybody, uh, anyone's come to see me privately or through other conversations will know I say this, I say, by the way, this information I'm giving you, there are problems with the reliability of it because the drug industry is there to make profit, because this is likely the best case scenario. Therefore, it's likely an exaggeration. Um, the patients in the clinical trials aren't necessarily representative of the people in the true population. So I give this caveat always with my patients, even the NHS in my clinics, I'd always tell them that. Patients appreciate it. They appreciate it. They value being honest about it. Um, and then assess the patient's understanding, then give feedback to them, ask them. So have you got, and just go through those key points, really important, repetition, make sure they understand, and if they haven't, go through it again with them. And then finally, last but not least, is what are the patient's preferences and values? You know, because if you give a patient a treatment that they don't really want, it's not going to work because they're more likely to be non-compliant. I mean, David's results, which I saw yesterday, were really outstanding and actually don't fit with most doctors um, around the low-carb diet because one of the problems, as we know, is that patients for sustainability are still constantly fighting the food environment. So I think that's probably a credit to David and his communication skills that keeps those patients on board as well um, through a, an informed decision-making process. So how well are we doing? Okay, I'm sorry to use this language. We're doing really crap collectively on shared decision-making. So actually, they've done a study to look at those six uh, elements of shared decision-making of informed consent. 
a doctor's using all six, what percentage are using? So 83% will discuss the nature of the decision, okay? 14% discussion of alternatives, and that can be partly because doctors don't have any alternative often. They think that drug is the only thing they have in their armamentarium. Discussions of risks and benefits, 9%. This is a study of outpatient clinic, by the way. So this is a, a review of, um, of doctors in an outpatient setting to see how many of them were adhering to shared decision making. Discussion of related uncertainties, 5%. Not surprising, you know. Most doctors are not going to talk about the fact that drug industry sponsored research is likely unreliable. I'm the only one that, you know, one of the few people that does that. <laughs> assessment, assessment of the patient's understanding, 2%. It's terrible. Come on. We can be doing better than this. As Gary Fetker would say, we can do better. And then elicitation of the patient's preference, only 19%. So there's a lot we can do. It's very identifiable, it's something that we can do. It's, it's non-controversial. And I think patients want this. So, you know, something we can work on. Um, oh, of course, sorry, and no discussion fulfilled all criteria. Not a single doctor actually was able, in that study, and it was several thousand doctors, actually was able in their conversation with patients to fulfill all the criteria of shared decision making. And it's not difficult. And it's just about empowering the doctors. It's not rocket science. I mean, you can have these six. We can get leaflets out. Maybe public health collaboration should do something, produce a booklet. Let's get it out to all GPs, all secondary care physicians. I think it will help improve healthcare massively. So what are the barriers? Well, there's pro pro professional indifference. Um, doctor knows best. You know, there's, there's still there's some of this old culture. Uh, we, you know, we need to evolve from that. Doctor doesn't always know best. Uh, organizational inertia, lack of physician comfort with decision aids. Again, it's about practice, it's about repetition. It's about, um, you know, throwing yourself a bit in the deep end if you're not used to this stuff. Time constraints, I think that can be overcome. I think they looked in this study and they said, if you add all of this in, it added maybe two minutes to the consultation. Now, I know that with GP demands and stuff, two minutes is probably quite a lot, but, it, um, but it's definitely doable. And I do it, although I probably talk very fast, so maybe that's how I get through it in my consultation. Uh, competing priorities, of course, and that applies, unfortunately, to conflict of interest, definitely much more in the US, where you've got a system where it encourages overuse because doctors get paid with if they're organizing more tests and investigations. Lack of training, we can, attack, we can address that through medical school, through postgraduate medical education, we can address that now. Lack of reimbursement, so let's think about other ways of making sure that doctors are getting uh, appropriately remunerated for this sort of work. Maybe we should be assessing doctors on shared decision making rather than on over investigation. Did you fulfill these criteria? Did your patient feel, you know, that should be the way we maybe we should be paying doctors, just an idea. Okay, now, when it works, it works really well. And um, you know, patient stories can be very powerful. And I wrote this piece co-authored with uh, Professor Dame Sue Bailey, former chair of the Medical Royal Colleges, uh, consultant child psychiatrist. And she, and I wrote this in the pharmaceutical journal. It's one of my uh, favorite articles that I've written because it, it brings all the evidence together around managing a patient with a heart attack and heart disease and talks about if we use shared decision making, we published this in 2018, of course, things have been thrown with the pandemic. So a lot of focus on what's important or certain other things that are very important has, has been missed. But it was, it has been calculated and there are all the organizations that know that if we do this, we will save the NHS billions of pounds. And likely improve patient outcomes. And the, the example we used in this case study uh, is actually uh, you know, one of our ambassadors, um, you know, a real credit to this movement. And uh, I'm just amazed by how well he's doing. So you know, Tony Royal came to see me in 2016. And, uh, and I think if, uh, I mean, Tony may disagree with me. I think I did use all of the criteria for shared decision-making, but he's doing amazing well. He had a heart attack, he had a stent, and he, through informed decision-making, through patient preference, through following a ketogenic diet initially, he's doing amazingly well. He's now six years. He's off all his meds still, I think. So Tony, take a bow. Tony Rawls here, brilliant. I mean, this is, this is what can be achieved. This is really what can be achieved. I know it may, people may think this is an extreme case, but this is like a gold standard of how we can do this. This is what we can achieve. Just the use of one example can be so powerful. And of course, that was covered nicely in the press as well. We've got the Mail Online and the front page of the, uh, the Daily Express, ditch pills to beat heart disease, I love that. Okay, let's move forward. So one of the things in this narrative, so part of combating this problem, and Nina alluded to this very eloquently yesterday, is there is a narrative also around whether it's about the low fat food movement or lowering cholesterol, or whatever it's been so, in, people have been so indoctrinated and ingrained 
with this message. And it's not easy to overcome. It doesn't happen overnight. But one of the other things that we need to also overcome is this perception about how great modern medicine is. Now, I'm very proud to be a doctor. We do some amazing things in acute care. But this study, which is very interesting, uh, which looked at, it was actually public health students, if I'm not wrong, that they, uh, that they, um, that they looked at. They grossly exaggerated in a survey the contribution of modern medicine to life expectancy. So they were asked, so between 1850 and essentially now, they were asked, there was an increase in life expectancy on average by 40 years. So these students were asked, how much do you think was a contribution of modern medicine? And the overall majority of 80% of them thought 32 years was because of modern medicine when nothing could be further from the truth. It was about three and a half to five years maximum. Most of the contrib contribution to increased life expectancy has been through public health gains. Um, you know, whether it's seat belts in cars, safer working environments, better sanitation, smoke-free buildings. The single biggest intervention that drove down death rates from heart disease and heart attacks in the last three decades was taxing cigarettes. The 50% the of the death rate reduction in cardiovascular disease is because of re reduction in smoking prevalence. 50% of uh, the population in 1960, 1970 were smokers, about 17% now, massive reduction. And it didn't happen from education alone. Education is extremely important, but it needed, um, it needed government intervention because smoking was so prevalent. And actually, I think we can apply the same principles to uh, ultra-processed food as well. So we have to address this myth as well. Good health doesn't come out of a medicine bottle. People need to understand it's about lifestyle and it's about the environment as well. How do we create those conditions? Remember the definition of public health to ensure that people have the best chance of achieving their optimal health. And I'm not talking about utopia here. We're never going to achieve per perfection, but we can certainly do a hell of a lot better than we're doing now. So let's also address this issue. So this is um, Tom Frieden's Health Impact Pyramid. I think a few errors are on this, but I think the most important thing to appreciate here is of course two things, is that if we're gonna improve population health, changing the context, making the default decisions healthy is gonna have a much bigger impact than counseling their education. Clinical intervention, certainly treatment for high blood pressure, yes, true for moderate to severe hypertension, not mild hypertension. Drugs give no benefit for mortality or even preventing heart attacks or strokes for mild hypertension. Yet most people in this country are on pills for mild hypertension. That's fine if you wanna take it, but at least be informed with that information and try the lifestyle stuff. High cholesterol, we know that's nonsense as well, obviously. Treatment of high cholesterol hasn't had any impact on reducing all-cause mortality. That's also been proven. Uh, diabetes, yes, insulin for type one, 100%. Very, very powerful. You know, you will die. People die, used to die with diabetes type 1 if they didn't get insulin. Um, for type 2, no real impact on the totality of data on all-cause mortality. Maybe some slight impact on cardiovascular events. Um, and definitely does help for microvascular complications, but not for all-cause mortality. So let's talk about the socioeconomic factors. It's a bit vague. It's, it comes up quite a lot. A lot of public health professionals talk about it. But actually, it's probably the most important. Um, but it needs to be redefined, and I'm going to help redefine it. So, you know, they've mentioned here poverty, education, housing, and inequality. So what's the biological mechanism? What's going on? Well, I'll come to that in a second. But the reason why um, policy-based interventions to make the default choice healthier um, will be more effective because they reach all parts of the population and are not dependent on a sustained individual response. Because, of course, we can adopt these lifestyle changes and go low carbon and everything else, but it makes it harder if the food environment is giving us or promoting foods that are the opposite of that. Okay, so what's going on here? What is the biological mechanism behind these socioeconomic factors? And I think we need to redefine it to change the narrative to help people understand this better, okay? I would say that it's better to talk about the biopsychosocial model. So what's going on here? We're talking ultimately at the root of this of chronic psychological stress. If you are, uh, if you don't have a secondary, um, uh, you know, school education, if you're unemployed, if you're in a high demand, low control, low paid job, it's very, very detrimental to health. Um, if you are in a circumstance, say you're a single mother and you're looking after a disabled child, you know, that is very, very detrimental to health. In fact, this, uh, my colleague and friend in uh, UCSF uh, in California, Alyssa Apple and Elizabeth Blackburn, they wrote this great uh, uh, editorial in Nature about the impact of stress on telomeres, on the aging process. And they actually showed that um, compared to um, uh, least stressed mothers, 
uh, you know, the impact on telomeres, so to mothers, for example, looking after disabled children or having, you know, in different, difficult relationships or whatever, that was, added, that was basically accelerating aging by about 10 years. We also know from separate data, if you're a child who is a victim of severe psychological abuse or physical abuse, that can knock off at the extreme end 20 years to your life expectancy. You know, this is epigenetics. This is, you know, the single most important relationship to the development of a human being is the one between mother and child. That nurturing relationship is so important. That actually determines health outcomes further down the line for lots of different reasons. And this was published not that long ago, uh, UCL researchers. I think Professor Michael Marmot, who's considered the guru of public health, uh, actually was involved in this research. So what's with social inequality? Why does that cause, why is it responsible for a third of premature deaths in the UK? So there's a lot of really interesting research on this and it's quite strong. And I, I recommend people to read this book. It is fascinating. What happens is that when you have more unequal societies, when there's a bigger gap between the rich and poor, it makes everybody more stressed because your people are constantly comparing themselves to each other. We call this status anxiety. America is a great example of the most extreme form of this. And you look at their health outcomes. A lot of this is being driven by the psychology of, of looking at, you know, and it's, a lot of it's materialism uh, based, but you, this, is what, this is what happens. And in fact, there's lots of data even showing that um, they did this uh, Whitehall study looking at civil servants. And they found that ones at the bottom of the, of the ladder in terms of their jobs, who were, felt that they were more um, undermined by their superiors, they were again less controlled, more stressed, they had increased levels of fibrin in the bloodstream. So their blood was more clottable and they suffered more heart attacks as a result of it. So let's also understand these structural drivers as well. And Michael Marmot says this, and I found this really fascinating because it, we have to think about this when, it, when we talk about policies, government policies, when they keep talking about we're creating all these jobs. It shouldn't be about what jobs are being created. What's the quality of those jobs? Because actually, again, if you are in a high demand, low control, low pay job, it is effectively a death sentence. Let's just change the narrative. Let's talk about it. Make everybody aware of it. This is not just, it's not good for health. So a poor quality and stressful job can be more damaging to health than being unemployed. And that's from Michael Marmot. Okay, so let's get on to, we're getting onto the money slides in the big one, which I've been you know, holding back and we're gonna, um, hopefully that will open your eyes even further. Let's go a little bit deeper. So as well as the socioeconomic, which is linked to this, we have the commercial determinants of health. And I love this uh, definition. Strategies and approaches adopted by the private sector to promote products and choices that are detrimental to health. And what happens is these practices by these big corporations that have a lot of power, which basically ultimately results, unfortunately, into marketing unhealthy products, exploiting their workers, and having a negative impact on society. So I think when we look at any entity and any business, we need to think, what's the overall net effect of, and we think about even our own lives with what we do. If we are contributing back to society, we are also more fulfilled, but society also does better too. Um, okay, this is it, right. So let's talk about this dimensions of power. What do the big corporations do and how do they control the narrative? So there are, this is a great paper. Um, which is from um, corporate practices and, and uh, influence on health. So the dimensions of power on the left there, you see, is that what they do is they, they, uh, they have, a, there's a one dimensional view which talks about power over decision making, control over the political agenda. The two dimensional view is power to define issues and potential issues. And then third, which is actually very important, power to avert conflict and keep conflict latent. This is what corporations do. So that basically making sure conflict between the interests of the powerful and those over whom power exerted is kept latent, is kept out of the spotlight, is not made, you know, the general population doesn't know what's going on, they don't even know that they don't know, right? How do they do this? Okay, political environment, they are a huge influence on politicians. They do this through lobbying, through being on committees in government. Um, if you're a politician, and I speak to politicians all the time, and I find a lot of the time, you know, there's no malice involved. They are literally just hearing one side of the story from lobbying from big corporations, whether it's food or pharmaceutical industry. And then I come along and say, hold on a minute, that's not true. Do you know about this? And like, what is it? You know, this, it, it's extraordinary. The lobbying can be, it's an invisible form of power and exerting influence over laws and regulations. Um, what else? Preference shaping. Okay, so uh, corporate foundations and philanthropy. Think of Bill Gates. Do you know the Bill, and, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is heavily invested in stocks of pharmaceutical companies, McDonald's and Coca-Cola? 
Bill Gates is a very influential man. That is a huge conflict of interest. Um, they capture the media. 80% of the, the broadcast media in the US is owned by seven big corporations. You know, people's opinions, most people's opinions are actually shaped by broadcast and print media. So again, people are only getting one version of the truth and that's not societies you want to be living in. And again, it you know, ultimately will cause harm, especially when it comes to health. Um, marketing and advertising, of course, they're able to market unhealthy products directly to consumers and vulnerable populations such as children. The knowledge environment, funding of research, we've talked about it. Most of the funding of research is coming from um, the drug industry. Um, legal environment, so they limit liability. So even if they commit harm, the shareholders, the executives are not held liable. Nobody's held liable. This is a legal entity that is the corporation that is there just to produce profit. It's not a human entity. It is very anti-human. Uh, unregulated activity, and then threat of litigation and preemption. So people, public health advocates, whatever else, we're constantly nervous sometimes of saying certain things because they've got very huge legal power to try and silence us. And then the extra legal environment, opposition fragmentation. We've seen it throughout the pandemic. Very credible doctors and academics have been silenced. They've been smeared. This is all in the playbook. It's all there. It could have all been predicted, the crisis we're in right now, this has been going on for many years. We need to understand this if we're going to combat it. And of course, this is then, it drives the poor health, the macro social determinants of health. Okay, risk factors, population health. This is actually at the root of, this is at the real heart of the problem. This is a system issue, system-wide issue. Um, Gerard Hastings, who's uh, been very involved uh, in tobacco control over the years, very eminent public health scientist, and he wrote this paper in 2012 in the BMJ. And he says, why actually corporate power is a public health priority? And he talks about the fact that the way that they have a playbook to start targeting children very young, you know, when getting them, whether it's hooked to sugar um, or whether it's branding opportunities, uh, this is their own marketers. They view children as important to marketers for three fundamental reasons. They represent a large market um, in themselves because they have their own money to spend. They influence their parents' selection of products and brands, and they all grow up to be consumers, everything. Hence, marketers need to build up their brand consciousness and loyalty as early as possible. But basically, he says this is a huge threat to public health, this sort of marketing. As well as lifestyle instances as lung cancer and liver cirrhosis, marketing threatens our mental well-being, exacerbates inequalities, and encourages unsustainable consumption. Public health should take a lead in addressing these issues, revitalize its upstream political functions, and regain its role as a champion for the underprivileged. Public health should also be leading a quest for an economic system, and I'm going to come on to that, that actively promotes better public health. Okay, so... You know, they, they, they are able to influence stakeholders, politicians, in a bid to influence policy, the, the agenda, and therefore undermine what is public health's most important armamentarium. Public health is often improved by movements and people prepared to challenge conventional assumptions and the status quo. And we have to take a lead in a movement away from a world driven by abeyance to the corporate bottom line and to the enrichment of an elite, to one that prioritizes physical, mental, social, and planetary well-being. You up for it? Yes. Good, good, right. We're almost there. Let's keep going, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Now, should we, should we reframe it? I'm, I'm being provocative here. The Corporation, if you haven't seen it, is an excellent documentary. There's also a book, okay? And this is the problem. This is not about individuals. I uh, debated the CEO of AstraZeneca a few years ago at the Cambridge Union, and the motion at that point uh, which I was obviously opposing, was that they said, this is a few years ago, we need more drugs prescribed to more people, okay? I had dinner with him, very nice guy. Um, we had a very, you know, lively debate, um, and I'm sure he's a, a good human to his family and his friends, but he is also a victim of the system because his job and his role is to produce profit to shareholders. And the entity, I'm not talking about people within, I'm sure, listen, we all know there are people out there, CEOs who probably actually do have the characteristics of being psychopaths, I'm sure. But the problem here is the entity that is a corporation is psychopathic in the way that it conducts its business and the way that it conducts its power. Callous, unconcerned for the feeling of, feelings of others, incapacity to maintain enduring relationships, reckless disregard for the safety of others, deceitfulness, repeated lying, and conning others for profit. Sound familiar? Incapacity to experience guilt and failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behavior. So the corporate entity, what is exerting most power and influence over population health in its 
form is psychopathic. Okay, and if you don't believe me on that, read this book. There's an open access documentary on YouTube. You can read that. And, and coming back to the NHS, my dad was considered what, probably one of the most prolific um, advocates for protecting the NHS from privatization. And I very much you know, agree with him on this. And the evidence is very clear. When you have a privatized system, both the rich and the poor suffer. The rich suffer because they get over-investigation, inappropriate tests, uh, you know, wasteful treatments, higher costs. And the poor suffer because they don't get access to health care. So a privatized system, because of the asymmetry of ex uh, information, because of exploitation, because of money, actually uh, is, is actually a lot worse than a, pub a proper publicly funded healthcare system. And actually, if you look at the European Union, hospitals that are publicly funded are at least as efficient, if not more efficient than private, private ones. So let's stick to the evidence. The reasons why this hasn't infiltrated in way into the mainstream as much as it should, or why certain successive governments, whether it's Labour government or Tory governments, have actually brought the market into healthcare is partly because of lack of knowledge, ignorance, um, either personal ideology or self-interest. Some of these people are making money from you know, these contracts as well, including politicians. Or certainly they go into lucrative jobs after they leave their career as MPs. So we need to make sure that that evidence is, we stick to the evidence, be clear about it. Now I've suffered myself and I, my worst nightmare came true. I started campaigning on this issue 10 years ago. I could see the NHS was heading in the wrong direction because we failed to tackle prevention. My mum suffered unnecessarily because her heart attack was missed. She was nine days with a missed heart attack because they were too busy in the local hospital. They're all very good, very able doctors, but they were under too much pressure. She then went into pulmonary edema. My dad and his best friend sat helplessly by the bedside because it took several hours while my mum was essentially drowning before she could get treatment. So she suffered unnecessarily. She was also a victim of food environment and maybe having listened to the talks yesterday, 100% my mum had food addiction. Okay, so all of these issues, and she was a very dedicated GP, the kindest, most loving mum anyone can, uh, can wish to have, but you know, it was heartbreaking. She died at 68. My father, can you believe, champion of the NHS, and actually um, ambulance failed to turn up for 30 minutes. I was on the phone to him uh, when he had chest pain. I knew it was cardiac. Uh, and then when I called back, he was already in cardiac arrest. And it was, you know, I was on the phone and I was actually very calm. And I said, listen, um, two doctors, his neighbors had witnessed it. I said, he'll be fine. We'll get a defibrillator in 10 minutes because I know ambulances arrive very quickly. They're supposed to. I've audited this stuff and written about it. And it took 30 minutes. And I had to FaceTime while I saw the cardiac monitor be put on my dad and see that there was asystole. There was nothing to shock. And when we investigated it, and I was told, by the way, I'm not going to name people. There was a, one cardiologist in this country who was a good guy. When I told him what happened, to say, listen, I'm biased here because I'm his son. I'm emotionally involved in this. I think he would have survived if the ambulance had turned up. Do you agree with me? And he said, absolutely, Yassine. But I wouldn't expose this. You don't want to make yourself more enemies. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to take that. You know, I wasn't, this, is, this is not just about my father. This is about everybody else knowing what was going on. Because it would have changed his outcome if I had known the ambulance delays. This was known about for several weeks. Somebody very senior in NHS England told me and contacted me. She was crying. She knew my dad. She said, Yassine, my own husband. My own husband had a heart attack three weeks, came back from playing football with chest pain. I knew the national data, the ambulances weren't reaching in time. She's a nurse, a former, a very senior nurse. She said, I didn't take him, uh, I didn't call an ambulance. I took him straight to hospital, rushed down the, uh, the hard shoulder to the, the nearest A&E. And he had an acute myocardial infarction and they saved him. If I had known this information, my dad would probably still be alive today because there's no way I would have asked him to wait for an ambulance or call an ambulance. We would have got someone straight to take him to hospital and he would have probably been defibrillated and survived. So, yeah, anyway. And then when we investigated, we found actually it was a private contractor, um, you know, that was actually responsible. Um, and the, the problem with these private contractors is they're profit-making businesses. So what they do is they get staff on the lowest pay possible, those staff are often less qualified than you know, NHS staff. Um, and then the morale is also low and there's more likelihood of error. So it's a lose-lose, it's a, it's a to be honest. I think when you bring profit into healthcare in a complex system of healthcare, I think it ultimately is detrimental to the patient. Um, and you know, it's good to see Bob Gill here today, who's a, a real expert on this, on the whole NHS privatization stuff. He's a, if you haven't seen his documentary, The Great NHS Heist, please look it up. It's just fantastic. He's the brains behind that documentary. Okay. We're getting towards the end, so let's just let's cut to the chase. So, what should we be doing in terms of policies? Well, I'm, you know, reiterate, and I'll just declare this is actually in my book, 
the 21 day immunity plan. And I, I came up with a, I was asked to come up with a top 10. And I think this is something that hopefully the public health collaboration can get behind based upon how we tackle tobacco. So we must tax ultra processed food. I think that's going to have a big impact on population health quite quickly. Um, uh, and use that money to subsidize uh, healthier products. Medical students and doctors need to have adequate training in, in nutrition and lifestyle medicine. Uh, every doctor should be measuring metabolic health. I think Campbell's going to be talking about that. I think that's really important. I think that'll have a big impact. Um, compulsory nutrition, uh, education, and cooking skills. You know all this stuff. Um, ch chief executives of hospitals need to be made, made accountable for selling junk food on the premises. You know, I've campaigned and got the medical royal colleges and got the BMA to make it policy. The barrier now is chief executives of hospitals that have got contracts with basically ultra processed food companies that still deliver junk food to patients who are bed bound. Even if they can't get to the, to the tuck shop, they're taking sugary drinks and crisps and chocolate. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? It's nonsense. We need to ban the advertising of it. I know Jamie Oliver's been on top of this. Um, we need a public educa education campaign so people can understand what ultra-processed food is and the harm it causes. Uh, a complete ban and dissociation of ultra-processed food and drink from sponsorship and sporting events. Um, and of course, medical staff, including doctors, nurses, and dietitians, should themselves be assessed on their metabolic health and encouraged to ha and help to improve it, not just to set an example to patients, but to optimize their own health and performance. If you're not healthy, you're not as productive. We know that in our jobs. If you're mentally and physically suboptimal, you're not going to be able to perform your job as well as you can. So that's also an important, we need to think about that differently as well, about why, why medical staff actually, you know, we know 50, more than 50% of NHS staff, unfortunately, are overweight or obese. And, and it's because of that food environment in the hospital, 75% of food purchased in hospitals is ultra processed, crap. I mean, it's, this is just unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, real evidence-based medicine. Let's come back to that initial slide at the beginning. So what is it? The application of individual clinical expertise with the best of evidence and taking into consideration patient preferences and values in order to improve patient outcomes. So relieve suffering and pain, treat illness, address risk to health. What does real evidence-based medicine mean? It makes the ethical care of the patient its top priority. Demands individual evidence in a format that clinicians and patients can understand is characterized by expert judgment rather than mechanical rule following, shares decisions with patients through meaningful conversations and builds on a strong clinician-patient relationship and the human aspects of care. And of course, we can apply these principles to public health as well. So how do we achieve it? Well, I think it's very clear. I'm sorry, I, I'm very happy to debate anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere on this. Drug companies should not be allowed to test their own drugs. They can produce them, but they can't be hiding data. They can't be doing the clinical trials themselves. If the drugs are so great, they should have no problem with independent researchers conducting that trials. All results of all trials that involve humans must be made publicly available. Regulators such as the FDA and the MHRA must be publicly funded. Do you know the FDA and the MHRA in this country get most of their money from the drug industry? That's a huge conflict of interest. Money clouds judgment. Independent researchers must increasingly shape the production, synthesis, and dissemination of high quality clinical and public health evidence. Medical education should not be funded or sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. I'm sorry, I'm gonna now, I've stopped going to cardiology conferences that are sponsored by drug industry. It's a complete waste of time. I can't trust any of the evidence that's being presented, unfortunately, or, or certainly I'm you know, doubtful of it because of the drug industry influence. Patients must also demand better, you know, patients here, you must demand better evidence, better presented in absolute terms, not relative risk, and better explained and applied in a more personalized way. Right, how do we do it? I've got a few minutes left. Sam, will you allow me a few, am I good for a few more minutes? Okay, we're almost there, right? Okay, how do we do it? This is a great concept from Thailand that we've got a mountain to move, guys, so we need to move this mountain, but we need to know how. Creation of relevant knowledge, the information has to be complete and correct. Okay, the social movement participation, we need to bring, we've already get, we've got a huge grassroots movement now with public health collaboration. And of course, the people that have the power to exert these laws, to exert these regulations, to create the conditions that are gonna give people the best chance, chance of having a healthy life are politicians and policy makers, right? And my own you know, journey in this, I've had a lot of experience and I just wanna emphasize here, it's not about a self-indulgent, you know, um, I don't wanna make this very self-indulgent, but it's just to emphasize for me, I started off as just a simple jobbing doctor. I was a cardiology SBR in Harefield Hospital, patient comes in with a heart attack, we treat him in the middle of the night with an emergency stent, next day on the ward round, being served burger and chips by the hospital, right? So that's when I started my journey, I contacted Jamie Oliver and things then developed from there. But the, the reason I'm putting this here, and I think all of us can 
learn from this. And you know, I've, I've also, uh, don't underestimate the power of the truth, the power of your speech. You know, it can change the world. It can really make a difference. You've got to stand up for, for the truth. People want the truth. Now, it's not without risk, but I look at it from a rational perspective. People sometimes say, I seem you very courageous and brave or foolhardy or whatever. I look at it as being rational. It's being rational to speak the truth. Because if we don't speak the truth, it's going to harm us further down the line. And if it's not going to harm us, it's going to harm our kids and future generations. So this is more about being rational than being courageous. Okay, and you have to have persistence and dedication. And Simon Chapman, you know, uh, greatest influencer on public health policy and smoking reduction in the Australia, in his uh, advocacy work, this is another great paper. Everybody can read this. It's only two or three pages, but it's wonderful. It's really interesting to read. And he gives some advice on that. And the key points are media attention on a public health issue is often more effective than private advocacy in winning policy change. It must be evidence-based, clear, and concrete. Of course, the evidence. We have to make sure we're, we're, we're on top of that. Speak out publicly, study the media, and be able to speak out at all times. Use killer attention-grabbing facts, but place them in a context of value system. Care about what you're advocating for. Really important. Um, you know, one great line comes to mind that David used many years ago, which I love, which is telling a type 2 diabetic to consume sugar in moderation is moderately poisoning them. Poisoning them. Very, very, uh, you know, very powerful. Just gets the message across very quickly. Use real people to illustrate your message. Tony Royal. You know, these sorts of the patient stories are way more powerful than some abstract academic terminology. You know, use real patients. They're very, very powerful stories. And social media, of course, now, you know, is having a huge impact. Mainstream media is still more important, but social media has a big impact, too. And also grow a rhinoceros side and be patient. These things take time. It's going to take time to change this, but we've got to keep pushing, OK? Um, because unless, and I've been a victim of this, many of other people here as well, um, you know, if you're an advocate for an un uncontroversial policy, as soon as you threaten this industry or an ideology, you will be attacked sometimes unrelentingly and viciously. Me and Zoe, uh, Harkham and Malcolm Kendrick, not so long ago, were on the front page of the Mail on Sunday being called statin deniers and effectively murderers and all sorts of nonsense and dangerous. But, you know, it, it, was, it was rubbish. It was nothing, there was nothing of any legitimacy there. Um, and Simon Chapman, of course, even says that his own university you know, gets flooded with complaints. So I think we need to be aware of that as we move forward, because I'm sure the more impact we have as a PhD, the more of these complaints are going to come in. We've just got to be able to deal with it and understand the context. OK, and of course, I didn't stop speaking out during the whole of the pandemic. Um, you know, I was I, as soon as we knew that I knew there was a link between metabolic health uh, and, uh, and poor outcomes from COVID. I thought we need to get this message out. And I did everything I could and kept hammering and persisting and eventually got some articles in. And then ultimately, uh, Matt Hancock contacted me and asked me for advice on it. And I told him very clearly in an email, um, you know, I said that a huge, there's a huge lack of awareness amongst the public and scientific community about the role of poor metabolic health is playing the pandemic. It is also likely a very significant risk factor for ethnic minorities having a poor outcome um, from COVID. And then more recently, and I know this is a controversial area, but the one thing that really, really got to me was when we started, when the mandate for NHS staff for vaccines came out. Now, it's not a question of, I'm a big proponent of vaccines. Traditional vaccines have been very powerful, saved about 6 million lives per year. Um, all vaccines are not the same. And I knew this was an emergency use authorization vaccine. I was very optimistic about its benefits to start with, but we know that it's, without, it's not without risk. And where there is risk, there should be choice. As soon as they announced this mandate stuff, I was livid. I'll be honest with you. I was livid. I did everything I could. Every opportunity when I was on BBC, Sky, LBC, I kept repeating the, three, the same three things. It's unscientific because we know it doesn't stop transmission. It's unethical because what about autonomy? Patient choice, in fact, staff choice. Um, and it's impractical. We're going to lose. There was about 100 NHS staff, 100,000 NHS staff could have lost their jobs. I was getting contacted by so many people in tears. Um, who were basically, there were nurses, there were doctors, friends of mine saying they weren't going to have the, I had it by the way myself, but they weren't going to have the vaccine. And they said, Asim, what do we do? We're going to lose our jobs. And if I just want to share this text message, because, you know, for me, uh, we got this U-turn and I did, I got direct messages to Sajid Javid as well. And I got, I won't name this, a very senior NHS leader that helped me to get that message to him. The day that he met him, he said, Asim, it's done. Well, we, and I knew that we were going to overturn this mandate. And it was very satisfying, not just from a, ethical perspective, but to contribute to helping save 100,000 jobs. I remember there's one uh, sonographer, this is from uh, Instagram, she messaged me on the left beforehand, and I was like, just hang in there, lots of people were about to resign, I said, no, you're gonna, we're going to save you, don't worry. You know, she said, the House of Lords have agreed this, you know, we, we, we're screwed. I said, no. And then, and then she messaged me, and this was, for me, this was really kind of, you know, this touched me, because, you know, you don't, you can, there's so much satisfaction you get in life from helping other people. 
You know, you don't get, you don't get financial reward for this, but this is way more powerful than anything money can give you, you know, to help somebody that save their job and, and at least keep the NHS afloat to some degree. Because a lot of people would have left, they dug their heels in and we would have been in an even worse state than we're in. Um, what do we do to counter the corporation? Well, um, I think we need to, you know, we, corporations are gonna be there. The problem is they've got too much power. So the field of public health needs to refocus our research and programs, reframe our way of thinking about and acting towards corporations, disconnect our programs, research and professional preparation from the corporation, and join efforts to redesign the corporation. This needs structural and legal changes to the corporation. Um, and then, you know, we need to think about, just have this conversation about what it actually means to be human. We've got this wealth of research from psychology, uh, from public health, about actually what drives people's health and happiness. Um, and I think also as part of that is, is having this conversation and making sure that our children need to understand that um, just gaining personal wealth through materialism is not the, uh, one of the most important values of human, uh, of human existence. It's not the way that they should judge their own success in life. Okay? It's about mo other more important things. And I love this quote from Robert F. Kennedy. Um, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. So what we're up against really ultimately is you know, this anti-human element. And Socrates and Plato, his disciple, talks about wisdom, courage, and justice. They're not separate entities. They have to be combined. If you want to lead a good and happy life, you have to think about those virtues. You know, there's a line I've used uh, repeatedly is that knowledge without action is vanity. Action without knowledge is insanity. <laughs> and wisdom without courage is fruitless. So let's just think also from ourselves and our own lives and how we, you know, this is the route, if you like, to leading the good and happy life. And of course, our real challenge moving forward, let's just remind ourselves, and Abraham Lincoln predicted this, is the anti-human, dare I say it, psychopathic entity that is a corporation. I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and cause me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow and the money money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the Republic is destroyed. When, and the founding, uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence at the, at the beginning of the founding of the United States, it's very interesting. You look back legally in that book, Corporate, uh, um, The Bottom Line or Public Health, talks about it, is that businesses were only uh, able to be formed, government could only charter businesses if they were producing a product that was beneficial to society. We've gone from there through undemocratic means, okay, so this doesn't involve population discussion, to now you can market unhealthy products to children. So we need to think about the roots of this problem if we're going to combat it. So are you ready to rise up against the organization of misery? Okay, rights are only won by those that make their voices heard. Hope is never silent. And one of my inspirations, Mahatma Gandhi, I'm going to use a new quote, which I've, I used a long time ago. It is health that is the real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Thank you very much.